Matthew chapter 1. Eighteen through twenty-five. Nobody here to tell me that they're already there. Okay, Matthew chapter one, verse eighteen through twenty-five. <clears throat> now the birth of Jesus was as follows: When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So if you were going to preach on this, you kind of have two main characters here. One is the person of Jesus, which is spoken of heavily, and the other one is his stepdad, Joseph. I want to talk about Joseph's assignment, and I want to talk about the uncomfortableness of God, or the uncomfortableness of God's assignments to you, but before I do that, we have to say a few things about Jesus that are brought up in this passage. It's massively important uh, stuff brought up here. The first one, and there's about four or five I want to mention real quick. The first one is the virgin birth. This is uh, a huge deal in Christian theology. It's the most important doctrine of the Christian faith as far as I'm concerned. It's more important than the resurrection because only Christ and His two natures could give me the righteousness of God. So, this really happened. A virgin really conceived uh, by the Holy Spirit. And, and, and this is a cosmic, massive event. Deserves its own talk. The second thing I, I mentioned a minute ago was the two natures of Christ. This is also a huge theological concept. I have one nature. I have a body, a soul, and spirit, but I have one nature. Jesus the Christ had two natures. The only person ever in the history of the universe that's ever had two natures. He was, at the same time, 100% God, and at the same time, 100% human. And when you deal with this person of Jesus, theologically, usually people go heavy to one side or the other, and the challenge is to stay right in the middle with that is that this is actually God. Jesus of Nazareth is actually God, 100%. Not partially, not kind of a pseudo, but all there. But here's the part that I have trouble with, is that he was also 100% human. So some of these Christmas, I don't know which Christmas song it is, uh, uh, I think it's O Holy Night, which is a great song, but not a, not a crying he made. That's absolutely wrong. He's human. He cried. He pooped. He, he got, he, all these things. Human. Human, human, human. We don't have time to go into that, but that would be another talk in and of itself. You say to me, how could somebody be 100% this and 100% that? It doesn't work. This is a sorry example, but I just received a wonderful Christmas card from our missionary, Stakai Alpha, the Evans. Uh, and uh, Paige, used to be Paige Lambert, but she married. And anyway, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rubber magnet. It's a magnet. It sticks to the refrigerator, but it's also bendable. It has almost two natures. That's as close as I can get to help you. The third major concept in verse 21 that, that we don't have time to really deal with today is that this person, Jesus, 
came to save us from our sins. And uh, Max Locato down in San Antonio has said this. This is his quote. If our greatest need would have been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need was technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need was money, God would have sent us an economist. But our greatest need was forgiveness, and so God sent us a savior. And that's a big deal, worthy of its own talk. The fourth thing I want to just draw your attention to is Isaiah's prophecy that is mentioned here. Uh, this prophecy was given about 700 years BCE, and it's a sign that God is up to something cosmic and massive in this birth of God becoming human. It's what the Magi discovered in Luke's Gospel. It's a big deal, and the whole history of the universe hinges on this one event of God becoming incarnate, becoming human. It's massive. So that could take a talk all of it itself. And then lastly, and I'll bring this up in just a minute, but the Messiah had to be from the ancestry of King David. King David's about a thousand years before this time. And Mary was not in the lineage of King David. And so Joseph, who is in the lineage of King David, is brought into the picture. That is how the Messiah can be called son of David. It is not through Mary, it's through Joseph. And that's a whole nother talk that would be worth <clears throat> something. But today I want to talk about Joseph, and he's a very important figure, and we don't hear much about him. He died somewhere between the time of these events and before Jesus was 30 years old because we never hear from him again. Um, and, uh, and that's interesting. And so he, he, uh, well, he fathered other children. So there's an, uh, a heresy out there called the perpetual virginity of Mary, which is a heresy. It's not true. Uh, the Bible tells us clearly that Jesus had other brothers and sisters, so she was a virgin when the Holy Spirit came to her. She remained a virgin until after Jesus' birth, but after that, Mary, who is a very special person and worthy of recognition and everything else, um, <clears throat> had other children, and Mary herself, it's pretty clear, became a follower of Christ uh, later on in life, and so did uh, some of his brothers and sisters. So uh, that needs to be said. And then, as I just said, Joseph did not have sex with her until after Jesus was born. That was part of his assignment, actually. But anyway, here's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about this guy because there's a lot of parallels between his life and my life and your life. The first thing is, in verse 20, is he is uniquely chosen. We are pretty in much, I think, in touch with God's choosing of Mary, the mother of Jesus. There's been a lot said about that. There's been a lot of theology about that. But not a lot of focus has been given to this guy, Joseph. But we need to see that Joseph was just as uniquely chosen as Mary was. He had a unique and huge assignment, just like Mary did. And uh, Joseph probably, like any of the rest of us, was not in touch with the magnitude of his assignment. Uh, he just thought he was getting married uh, to this pretty little girl, and he was doing what a Jewish man at his stage in life should do, and that is get married and start a family. <clears throat> and he didn't realize that he was uniquely chosen, but he found it out pretty fast. And there's two things that Joseph provided in this thing that are important. The first one I already mentioned is a legal thing. The Messiah had to be of the lineage of King David. Mary was not of that line. Joseph was. And so the Messiah had to be the son of David. And he was because of Joseph. And because of Joseph's involvement in this situation and because of Joseph saying yes to God. Um, were there other men of marrying age who were of the descendants of King David? Probably there were. Uh, but for some reason, God chose this man over others to be the father of Jesus. The second thing, and I think for us, is 
maybe more important, is the relational side. God needed a good father to raise Jesus. Jesus would need formation, he would need love, he would need nurture, and a good father could give that to him. I'm on the 100% human side here. You guys with me on this? This is a 100% human baby. <clears throat> Jesus was fully human, and he needed role modeling of a good father in order to shape his view of Father God. Joseph's character helped form Jesus' view of God. Joseph taught Jesus how to work with his hands as a carpenter. He taught him what it meant to be a faithful husband and a provider. He taught Jesus what a man is supposed to be. We don't know much about him, but verse 19 says he was a righteous man. It means that he kept the Mosaic law. It means that he was a good example of what a man of God is. Right? So I bet Jesus saw his dad, Joseph, getting up early in the morning before carpentry work and praying. I bet Jesus watched Joseph pack up the family every Sabbath and take them to synagogue and learn the scriptures and fellowship with the community of other God followers in the town. How else would Jesus have learned the scriptures? These are illiterate people. Jesus couldn't read. There's no chance that Jesus knew how to read or his father or his mother. But a rabbi at the synagogue was literate and could read the Hebrew scriptures. And the, the thing is, is that the family would memorize the scriptures. That's probably what happened. They didn't have paper, and paper was valuable back then. You, the normal family didn't have parchment or, or anything like that. That's why we call them the scribes and the Pharisees. These were people that went to school to learn how to read and write. And so the normal uh, village people are illiterate, and they would, they would have known the scriptures, and Jesus knew the scriptures, but how did he know them? He memorized them. How did he memorize them? Well, they don't have Netflix. And the sun goes down. What's the sun go down now? About 5.15, 5.30 right now? Comes back up about 7.15? That's a lot of dark. They'd sit around the fire, the family fire. They'd eat. They, would, they had oral tradition, and they practiced memorizing the Scripture. That's how Jesus learned the Scripture. He couldn't have done that if he didn't have a man of God in the house. Right? God knew all this. He purposely put Joseph and Mary together. It was an ordained situation. Joseph pleased God in his single years, and God said, that guy is the guy I want to raise Jesus. A very unique calling. So here's the thing about it, is that you have a unique calling too. So do I. I didn't, you didn't stumble into the job that you're in. You might have thought you did, but you didn't. You didn't stumble into the marriage that you're in. You didn't stumble into your career. You didn't, there was somebody leading and guiding you through this thing. Even, you say, wait a minute, I wasn't living for God. I was making stupid choices. Yep. God is big. He's so big that even when you're making stupid choices, he can still put you in a certain way. Can I get an amen up in here? How many of us have been in a situation and you knew you weren't in the right place and God slammed a door on you and it, and it saved you later in life? You, you say, wow, right? You weren't seeking God. You weren't praying. You were just being just whatever you were and God blocked that. There, matter of fact, you're alive today because God has saved your life. I mean, I'm talking about it. He saved my life one time. I don't have time to go into it, but, and I was acting a fool. But God is bigger than my foolishness. It's God's hand that has put you where you are and has given you the life experiences that you have. Everything you have is from Him. Your education, your health, your skill set, your wisdom, your talents, all of them are unique gifts from God for you. And each one of us has a unique assignment. And I can't fulfill your assignment, and you can't fulfill mine. 
We each have to walk into our assignment. And you might be here today and saying, I've never heard this before in my life. Well, that's why God brought you here. Because today, you need to pray before you leave this room and say, oh God, you've opened my eyes. I'm not just an orphan in the universe, bouncing around like an old pinball machine. I'm the ball and they're bouncing between one bad experience to the next. Wait a minute, there's a plan here and I need to get in touch with that. That may be why God brought you here today. But the goal is to discover what God has uniquely called us to do in this chapter in our lives. There's different chapters in your lives, right? There's a, a chapter when you're single. There's a chapter when you're young married, maybe. If you get married, some people don't get married. It's okay. Some of the best people that did most work for God are single people. St. Paul, Jesus, I can just go on. But the thing of it is, is to find out in this season in life, what is the unique assignment that I have? And to get on about doing that, right? And when we do this correctly, we avoid the comparison thing. If I'm really okay with who I am and what Christ has called me to do right now in this chapter in my life, then I don't have to be jealous of you. If you got a nicer vehicle than I do, I don't have to sit here and be envious or jealous of your vehicle. Matter of fact, that's breaking one of the Ten Commandments. Don't do that. That's stupid. And it all really boils down to where do I get my significance? Do I get my significant need met through Jesus? Or do I get it horizontally through comparing myself to you and the next guy and how big a garage they have, how big a house they have, or something like that? And the best way to get in touch with your significance is to get it straight from the source, and that is God himself. And how do you do that? You do that by having what I call daily devotional time. That means that you set aside a piece of time that you're going to meet with God every day. And you're going to have an open Bible, and you're going to humbly submit yourself to the Word of God. And you're going to say, God, I'm here. I'm setting aside uh, however long, 30 minutes, 45 minutes this morning to hear from God, to get a download from God. I have my phone off. I have, I have it on airplane mode. Nobody's going to interrupt me, and I'm here for you, God. That's what I'm here for. And this is where you learn to pray, and this is where you learn to hear God. This is how it happens, you know? Um, it happens through community as well, but so many people feed off the community and are not getting directly from the main line. And that's where, where we have, have things go wrong. So there's two sides of your life. There's the, 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 the doing side, stuff that you do, and then there's the being side, being with God. If you're not being with God, then your doing is going to be a little bit off or maybe a lot off. And so the being with God is, is, is an intentional spiritual practice that is not just for super saints. In 2020, we need to get intentional about this. We need to intentionally focus on our personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. That's why Jesus came. Not to negate the need for community, not to negate the need for the church, not to negate the need for uh, the sacraments or whatever else, but your unique calling, your unique assignment is going to be communicated, and, and it's more than just, okay, I'm called to be faithful here at this chapter in my life. It is the fact that God has something to say about work. Your job and your people on your job, He has something to say to you about that. Every day. Every day. And Lord knows you know about 50 people that need prayer that can't pray for themselves, don't know how to pray, don't know God, not in touch with God. And so there's that. But I was, I was, I've been, I've been having this, whatever you want to call it, quiet time, devotional time with God um, since the summer of 1986, pretty long time. And uh, the other morning I was sitting there and, 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 and I, I thought of 
several men that I know. Now, don't get nervous. None of them are in the room here. I'm not talking about you. I'm not making eye contact. I know a lot of people. And I know for a fact, these two or three guys I was thinking of, they have asked Jesus to come into their life. I know they have. Matter of fact, with one of them, I was there when it happened. However, when I spend time with these men, I do not sense the Spirit of God around them or on them or anything else. Matter of fact, uh, and, and I'm not being negative about it, it's, it was a question mark in my mind, is that when I'm around them, I don't feel any different than I do when I'm around other guys who don't know God at all. But I know for a fact these people are open to, uh, to God. They, they come to church every so often. They, they are, uh, they're not offended if somebody prays before a meal, even out in public. They think God is a good thing, but they're not getting the victory that I see in other people's lives that I know have asked Jesus in their life. And I said, Lord, what is the disconnect with these guys? I love them. What's the disconnect? How come is it that, 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 that they know, they'd never talk about you? They never tell, like when I'm with them, uh, whoever I'm doing with, and, and we're just two of us ride together in the pickup, they're not telling me, hey, this is what God showed me today, or hey, God convicted me of this, and nothing like that. I'm sitting in there, and I'm riding down a road, and it's, it's no different than if I was sitting with some guy who didn't know anything about God. And I said, what is the difference? And God said, the difference is what you're doing right here. And I said, what am I doing? He said, you are humbly sitting as a humble individual before the open word of God and saying, speak to me today, Lord. Your servant is listening. And I said, really? That's the difference? He said, that's where it starts. That these men, their lives don't look any different from the world because their lifestyle is no different from the world. They don't have any time for God. They get up, they spend their money, they do everything else just like anybody else in the world as if they don't even know Jesus. And because of that, they're not getting any victory in their life either. And so to them, it's a disconnect. The things of the Lord, the things of God, are they're in one little category called spiritual, but this is real life over here. So spiritual lasts for an hour and a half on Sunday, maybe, if they go to church every week, but most of them don't. And, the, and then real life's over here. Bills and marriage problems and raising kids' problems and tuition payments for kids in college and yakety smack and everything else. Am I getting through? In 2020, we got to make a change, people. We got to say, you know what? I don't know about anybody else. I don't know about these other guys, but for me and my house, we're going to do something different in 2020. We're going to start with personal devotion time every day. I'm going to meet with God every day. I'm just going to do it. It's, it's what God's calling me to. And whether I get anything out of it or not, I'm going to do it because God is God and I'm not. Mr. I'm talking to the men in the room. That's going to be the difference of you being able to really navigate and lead your family and not. Okay, so that's kind of the first thing. There's another thing that happens in Joseph's life. Verse 20. The angel says, don't be afraid. Now, why would the angel tell Joseph to not be afraid? Because there's a whole lot to be scared of right here. That's why. Listen, he's just doing life. Everything's okay. And then this whole unplanned pregnancy thing happens. Now, here's the Jewish betrothal situation that the man is in. Very different than our situation here. It was an arranged marriage. Two families come together and said, uh, we got a pretty little daughter here. She needs a husband. You guys got a, a son over here that needs a wife. You're a good family. We're a good family. Let's arrange this thing. And, uh, and so it's done. There's a, there's a, a year-long period from the time it becomes legal at the, at the engagement. <clears throat> and the deal is, as she lives with her parents and you live with your parents, you do not have sex, but there are some, you come together, you spend time together, but no sex. And it's a year-long process before then you, you actually get married and then you can have sex and consummate the marriage and all that. But in this whole year thing, it's the year where we find out if you're faithful. And so 
And, and it, so this is the Jewish cup. Now it's a legal thing, and so that if something goes wrong in that whole year, it's an actual divorce. And it had to happen publicly, and, and it had to be on grounds of not that I changed my mind because it's an arranged marriage anyway. You don't really get a choice in this. But it's sexual immorality. If sexual immorality happened, then there's a divorce that has to happen. It has to be public. And the Jews in the first century didn't have the authority to do this, even though they tried, like in John chapter 8. But in the Mosaic law, it was take rocks out and stone her to death if she's been messing around. Now, by the time this happened, the Romans, they were an occupied country. The Romans wouldn't let them kill each other like that. But it was that big of a breach of the contract. Could I say it like that? So, so that's where the man finds himself. He's in the year long, and it seems to me it's close to the end of the, the, the process, and all of a sudden, she turns up pregnant. Now, this is a small world. This is a village world. Everybody knows everybody. So, this is huge. The guy's in a real jam here. She's been sleeping around on me. She's been cheating on me. Uh, there's hurt. There's betrayal. There, she's been lying to me. Dreams are shattered. Um, can you imagine a private war? This guy, he's a righteous man. He didn't do it. He's kept his hands off of her. He's done everything right. The whole village, everybody's looking at, at, at them, and all of a sudden she turns up pregnant. What I mean, you talk about a shattered life, you know? Uh, this is huge stuff. Everything is ruined. So I can't imagine the guy's private war as he takes this information in and he says, oh, what do I do? You know, and he's a righteous man and, and it seems like there's love and affection that he has for the young lady. So he decides not to take her out and make a big deal. Hey, look at this slutty girl that I got hooked. You know, he doesn't do that. He says, I'm going to try to do this thing quietly, but that's a joke. It's village life. There's no way that you're going to be able to hush this deal up. Everybody's going to know. So he's, what do I do? What do I do? So he says, well, I have to do the right thing. The right thing is divorce her. That's the right thing because she's broken the rules. I haven't broken the rules. She's broken the rules. I'm not trying to hurt her. I'm not trying to shame her name. If he was trying to shame her name, he could have easily done it. He said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to protect her as much as I can, but I, I can't fix this. This is unfixable. He's righteous. He didn't do it. Let's get out of it as best we can, and she'll have to live with the shame. I don't know. So he makes up his mind to do that, and then something crazy happens. A dream happens. But it's not just a dream, it's a visitation. He knows beyond the shadow of a doubt it wasn't just a dream. He had a visitation from an angelic being. And that's probably another reason they said do not fear. Every time angels show up in the Bible, the first word the angel says is don't be afraid. Why? Because it'll scare the poop out of you when an angel really shows up. And so the angel says, basically, Joseph, you're in a jam. But guess what? There's another option. There's the God option. And the God option comes when we hit the end of our options. Some of y'all have hit the end of your options today. You're facing massive impossibilities in the coming year. Let me tell you something. There's something else called the God option. And the God option shows up through the voice of this angel. And it's an assignment from God. And it's a very uncomfortable assignment from God. It's a threefold assignment. Marry the girl, name the child Jesus, raise the child. It's a threefold assignment. The problem with doing the God option is that if you do it this way, the way this angel is telling you to do it, everybody will think that Joseph impregnated her. So here he is, a spotless man of impeccable sexual character, and the God option requires him to step into the mess and therefore always be associated in the gossip circles of the village life as the guy who really was the bad guy in the thing when he was totally clean. 
the uncomfortableness of the God assignment. When God comes to our lives and we start working with our lives, there's going to be some uncomfortableness that comes with it. His reputation will be forever question marked. And you see this in the other Gospels about Jesus' who is your father? You see these questions come up. The rest of Joseph's life, the rest of Jesus' life. Let me tell you something. If you're going to follow Jesus, there's going to be a mark on you. You're going to be different. Your reputation may be called into question because of righteousness, because you do something that God told you to do and it didn't make sense to some other people. But there's more to be afraid of. (laughs) How could you possibly raise the Son of God? Who's who's capable of that? Uh, James Dobson, maybe? Let's get him over here. Oh, he's only 78 years old. If he's even still alive, I don't know that he could do it. How can I do this thing? It's more than I can handle. It's too much responsibility. Not only will my reputation be ruined, but I've been entrusted with something far too large for me. And this is how God works with you and me, friend. He gives us assignments that are too big for us. We're overwhelmed. There's no way we could do what God is requiring of us in 2020. It'll cost too much. It's too scary. It's too threatening. It'll change my life. It'll change my plans. I don't want to do it. It's too much. I had a nice life planned out here. And now you're asking me to do something crazy and radical. No way, God. I want my nice, safe, predictable, controllable life. If I follow you, God, you're going to change me into something I never planned on being. Wow. This is hard on Americans. This business of the fact that God is the potter and you're the clay. This business of God is the one that forms you and shapes you into who He wants you to be and you don't have a lot of say in it. You still want to be a Christian? He molds you into the image He wants for you, not the image you want for you. And the sooner you can get on page with his plan is the best, the easier things will go. So there's a lot to be afraid of. But God says, don't be afraid. You got some stuff to be afraid of this year, probably, don't you? Impossible marriage situation that you're in, maybe. Impossible financial situation. God's going to give you a way out, but it isn't going to probably be the easy way. There is easy ways. God's probably going to make you take the long way around. I'm not trying to be a prophet, but that is usually how he works. You know, he's asked me to do a lot of stuff I didn't want to do. And I can't tell you on the first day that I really was yippy skippy, I'm happy to do this. It takes me a while. Because i got to get honest about it, and i got to journal about it. I got to think about it and and all that, but you know, in the end, well, here's my, no, this wasn't my last major assignment, but it was one not too long ago, and that's this building that you're sitting in right here. I didn't want to build a church building. I don't want to build a building. You know why? Because I got to talk to you about money. I got to sit you down and say, as a church, are you you part of this church? Yeah. Well, as a church, we're going to build a building. And God has asked me to sit you down and ask you how much you're going to give to this. You know how un-American that is? You know how uncool that is? It became very clear to me early in the process that's what God was requiring of me. I, I want y'all to like me. I, I don't want to be known as, oh, that preacher over there, all they do over there is talk about how to get money out of, out of your wallet and into theirs. Your reputation's at stake. But yet, the counselors that we hired to help us get through this process said, you, sir, 
or the senior leader of the church, and you've got to figure out a way to sit every person in the church down and ask them how much they're going to give and get them to write it down. Micah didn't like it very much. He called me over to his house. He said, what's all this about? I've been in the church about however long it was, and what are we do? What, what's happening now? And, I, and he's honest. That's how we all felt. That's how I felt. But God showed me something in Psalm 78, 9. It says, the sun, th this one I was having my quiet time. Listen to you something. God will talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. And the problem is, when we're not doing one-on-one -on -one with God, then he has to bring some other people to talk to you. And it's funner when it's just you and God. So it was just me and God that morning. And he brought me to Psalm 78, 9. It says, the son of Ephraim were trained as archers, yet in the day of battle they turned and ran. And God said, John, you got a choice. You've been trained, you've been uniquely chosen to lead this group of people right now into building that building, what I'm telling you to do. But, but, but you have your own free will. And though you're trained as an archer and trained in warfare, you can turn around and run away like a fraidy cat. You can do that. But I will not bless that. Man, I'm afraid of failure. What were the odds, really? What are the odds? There was only about uh, 200 people that did this thing. What are the odds? We don't have rich people here. We don't have big checks here. We got just working people. What are the odds that, that 200 individuals could do this? It's about a $2 million project when you added it all up. The chances of failure are incredible. The chances of me crashing the church and we are a church no more are incredible. The chances of my reputation being ruined, done. He's just a money grabber. So that was one of my assignments. I've had some other ones that are just as scary, but listen, you know, how long are you going to live? How long am I going to live? There's going to be a day when I'm called home to meet my maker, and I'm going to stand before him, and, and he's going to say to me, I gave you this assignment, what'd you do? I gave you this one, what'd you do? I gave you this one, what'd you do? This is, this is the, the final judgment of us believers, and we're going to have to give account. We say, I didn't trust you. I was, I was afraid. I was a wicked and lazy servant. I'm not going to be that guy. It might take me two or three days, two or three weeks to wrestle my pride and my ego to the mat and my fear and all that stuff. But I'll tell you what, in the end, at least up to this point, and I don't plan on quitting anytime soon, I always will get up and do what the Lord telling me to do. And I wish I could tell you that I always do it real happy and I'm a happy, you know, dancing around Christian. No. Oh. Sometimes, listen, you know what courage is? It's not the absence of fear. It's doing the right thing in the middle of being afraid to death. Uncomfortableness of God. And then the last thing we see with this guy in verse 24, trust and obey. So he could have quit. He could have opted out of the God assignment. And you can opt out too. You can give up. And say the calling on my life is too hard. It's too large for my character. God's asking me to do too much. I'm a frail and a weak person. I cannot rise up and walk into my calling, whatever that may be. I have too many dysfunctions. Listen, there's 150 reasons why I, John McComb, can't do what God's calling me to do right now. There's 150 reasons probably. And maybe for the same for you. Because it's a whole lot easier to stay sick than it is to get well. It's a lot more comfortable to stay right where I'm at, to stay right where I'm at. You say, well, what I got ain't great, but you know, it's okay. The enemy of the great is always the good. The good, well, it's okay, you know what? It's good, yeah. But God has an uncomfortable calling that is better. You know, so, verse 24, when he awoke from his sleep, he did as the angel commanded him. He chose to obey and leave the results up to God. Would he perform perfectly as the daddy of Jesus? No, probably not. Would he make some mistakes as all parents do? 
Probably so. Would he be a sterling role model? I don't think so, not if he's human. But in spite of his limitations, he decided that God had chosen him for this assignment and he could trust and obey. And it's better for you and for me to trust and obey than to stay where we are. God knows what he's doing. He knows that you will fail from time to time, but he chose you anyway. And he has a plan anyway. So at, today, at the end of 2019, facing the beginning of not only a new year, but a new decade, I just think about it for a minute. What's it going to be like we're sitting here 10 years from now at the end of 2029? Look back on the last 10 years. <clears throat> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And like Joseph, there's a lot of people counting on you. Actually, there's more people counting on you and looking at your life than you think. So what are you going to do? Are you going to obey or are you going to walk away? You're faced with the decision. Once God gives the assignment, all neutral is gone. You either obey or you walk away. As I said a minute ago, courage isn't the absence of fear. It's doing the right thing right in the middle of fear. So don't be afraid. Trust and obey. Now, you'll have some real chances to get out. And I remember in April of 1994, I've been working on a church staff in Austin for about two years at that time, a little bit more maybe or less. And uh, I was a single person. I just told you single people have done more for the kingdom probably than married people. However, how many of you know that getting married, sure enough, knocks some rough edges off of you. Can I get a witness? Raise up your hand, Russell. I'm looking right at you. So there was some personal immaturity in my life in April of 1994. I was single. I didn't have Susan to chew me out, straighten me up. Holy Spirit was trying. And then he used my boss. You ever had your boss? God used your boss? to point at some things in your life and to say, uh, this needs a change. And, you know, it's one thing if you're working for a secular boss who doesn't know God from a bar of soap. It's easy to kind of, but I've had secular bosses straighten me out for my own good, praise God. God can use a, a donkey to talk to you. But this time he used a pastor of a church, and I was the youth pastor, worked for this guy, and uh, he got in my face. And he told me there were some things in my life that he observed that he didn't like. And, uh, and that needed to change if I was going to keep working there. And the sad thing was he did this in front of four other people. Now, and looking back on it, it's probably my own fault. Because anytime you get your rear end chewed out in front of some other people, it's probably because you opened your mouth in front of those people and you shouldn't have. But he cleaned me up pretty good right there in front of those people. Embarrassed me. In 94, I would have been uh, 30 years old. And uh, I don't think he knew he was talking to a recovering redneck. And uh, I was about that close to showing him what redneck wrath could look like. But God called me up short right there. He said, yeah, John, you want to, you want to tell this guy where to go and get up and walk out of this deal and peel out all over the front of the building or whatever you're going to do with your pickup, which I had intended to do? He said, did this man call you to work here or did I call you to work here? I said, well, Lord, best I can tell, you called me to work here. He said, then you can't quit unless I tell you to quit. So I said, okay. And that was the end of that. And it wasn't none of this touchy-feely stuff like we have now. Oh, I might have offended you. I have to come and talk to you. I ain't like that. No, no. It's a country rear-end chewing, and there ain't no apology about it. No matter what he did wrong in the conversation, I never heard of, hey, I'm sorry, I could have handled that different. Or, none of that. You just got it, and that was it. And you know what? That's all right. That's okay. But I, I was thinking about it. I thought, what if I would have quit right then? 
That's my unique call. I didn't know it at the time. I thought I was supposed to be a missionary, and I thought I was just doing time working for this guy for a couple, three years, trying to learn some ministry skills because God was going to call me back to Southeast Asia. That's where I thought I was headed. But you know, God knew where I was headed. God knew I was headed for this right here. And that was my training ground for this right here. And, and, and another thing about it is you've got to learn to submit to authority. You ain't going to make it very long in the kingdom without learning how to submit to authority, even when the authority maybe didn't handle it quite right. You know, so I had a chance to quit in 1994, and I'm sitting here now, and I'm glad I didn't. You know, I raised my kids, I raised all three of my kids in a church plant situation, and, and I'm glad of that. I'm really glad of that, and, and I'm glad of people that extended a lot of grace to me over the years, not just this guy, but other people, when I really was wrong and really was immature and really did have some emotional problems and really did need correcting, and whether they corrected me or not, stuck with me through it, you know, I appreciate that. But another time happened in, in 2011. And I, I was on a, a seminar in England, in, at Oxford, England. And it was a rainy night. I've told this story before. I was in a rainy night in a chapel. And what was going on back here in San Marcos was God had told us to buy some land. And I didn't want to buy any land. I don't want to buy, buy land and build a building. We can do church in a warehouse. We can do it under a bridge. We can do it out of the back of a trailer. We can do it on a food trailer. We can do it anywhere. We don't need to go into all that yakety smack of the American church thing and all this stuff. But God has said... Why don't you buy some land? Well, me and Hunter Bruton here, <clears throat> Sam Marcus, looking for land. There's one piece of land available. It's this piece right here, 23 acres. Too big, didn't need it, weird shape. Started working with the city. The answer was no, you cannot build a church on that piece of land. And there's a lot of reasons why. None of them were good reasons, I didn't think. But nonetheless, we had worked six months trying to make this deal work, and the deal was dead. So I had to go to this seminar. So I'm at this seminar in Oxford. It's a rainy night. I go in this chapel, ancient chapel, <clears throat> walking around in there. God visits me in there. And I just told him straight. I said, you know, I'm about done with this. I did what you told me to do. You, you told me to go to San Marcos and start a church, and that was 10 years. Been doing it 10 years. Done that. Make disciples the best we could. Been doing that. And now I'm about done with it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the conflict. I'm tired of the uncomfortableness of the God assignment. I'm tired of People who don't want to be disciples getting bent out of shape. and all. I'm tired of it. I'm just tired of it. We can't get the land. Uh, it ain't going to work. Um, it's a dead deal. I just, I think it's just time to do something else. But I submit it to you, God, because you're the potter and I'm the clay. What needs to happen? And, you know, when you talk like that to God, I usually don't get an answer immediately, but I kind of get this feeling of peace that I've been heard. And then, usually over the next few days, God starts bringing confirmation and answers, you know, through various ways. But anyway, at that night, I really feel like God said, I'm not done with you. And now, sitting here in 2019, I'm glad that I didn't quit then. Because we would have never, as uncomfortable as it was, to finish up over there at, at the McCoy's building, and then the, the next assignment was turn the culture of the church to prayer. That was the assignment given in 2012, 2013. We did that. On a Monday night here, we'll have no less than 40 people. And some, we've had as many as 85 or 90, some Monday night. God has turned us into a praying community. A lot has happened. And I'm just glad that I didn't opt out of the uncomfortable assignment back then, too. So that's kind of it. I just want to warn you that if you're going to follow Jesus, he's going to give you some uncomfortable assignments. And, and, and you know, it's, it, some of them look good to your worldly friends, and some of them don't. Some of them are downward mobility, where you actually take a pay cut to go follow God. It, you know, everybody applauds it, right, when, when, oh, he left that thing to this other thing, and it's a move up. But a lot of times, God will turn you go sideways or even go downward mobility and you know it really boils down to did you hear from God and you know he doesn't leave you just alone in that quiet place that's where it starts but he puts a few other people in your lives you can bounce those ideas off of and stuff but I'm going to tell you God's going to call you to some uncomfortable assignments and some of you guys are facing it right now because in the next 10 days you're going to have to interface, interface with some people that you avoid most of the year Right? In laws and outlaws. And we gotta to come together at Christmas and act like we're happy. And during the regular season you can navigate those relationships, but on this 
week, you're going to have to deal with this. And my belief and prayer for you is that you're going to win, that you're going to be the voice of God's presence in those situations. But there's some uncomfortable assignments coming in 2020, and you may already know about them. There's some things that have to change in some marriages. There's some things that have to change in some finances. There's some things that have to change in your personal walk with God. And uh, He hasn't left you alone. He's here. He, he doesn't say, go do this and, and ch I'll check in on you later. He says, go do this and I'll be with you. And so I really want to pray for you. So if we could just all stand up really quick.